Hello, everybody. My, uh, my name is Caleb Newquist, and welcome to this Gusto's Facebook Live broadcast on tax reform, overhyped or underhyped. Um, like I said, my name is Caleb Newquist. I'm the editor at large of Gusto. Um, and please don't call the police. That child does belong to me. Um, she was not a hostage, um, but that's me. And um, I'm here with uh, this lovely panel, and we're going to talk about uh, tax reform, and so I'm going to introduce them to you now. Uh, first, we have Andy Smiles, creator of andysmiles.com. She's based here in San Francisco. Next, we have Kenji Kuramoto. He's the founder and CEO of the community in Georgia. And last but not least, we have Will Lopez, founder and CEO of Advisor Fi, Advisor Fi excuse me, out of Palm Beach, Florida. Um, thanks for everybody for joining this broadcast um, and this conversation we're going to have about tax reform. But first, before we get started, I need to say a few words so the lawyers off screen will stop glaring at us. And that is uh, lots of things we're going to talk about here today. We'll deal with um, tax law and the tax code, regulations, revenue rulings, all kinds of stuff. Um, we aren't your lawyers. We aren't your tax advisors. And so none of the stuff that we say here today should be taken as legal financial law or tax advice. So if you're unsure or if you want more information, please consult your own tax advisor before you do anything. All right, so now that we have that out of the way, um, I guess I'll just give a little bit of uh, background for those who aren't familiar. The Tax Cuts and Job Act went into effect in December 2017, so it was just over a year ago, and it was the first major piece of tax reform legislation in over 30 years. It cut tax rates for virtually every business and individual taxpayer across the economic spectrum. It eliminated or limited a lot of popular deductions and it added a lot of new wrinkles too. So it was very complex, it was wide ranging, it was hyped by a lot of politicians and it was covered widely in the media. But more recently, as people have kind of been looking back on it, there's some, been some doubt about its effectiveness and also even the awareness among small businesses. And that's what we're, some of the things we're gonna talk about today. The law was passed very quickly um, at the time, it was just under two months, and it was around the holidays, so it seems reasonable that maybe a lot of people didn't hear about it or aren't very familiar with it. So, with all that background in mind, it raises the question, was the tax reform bill overhyped or underhyped? And to help answer these questions throughout the session, we have these little paddles, overhyped, underhyped, and um, our panel here is going to interject with those throughout the session today. So, all right, everyone, tax reform, overhyped or underhyped, what say you? I would say, I would say it out loud. Okay, <laughs> yeah, no, you're allowed to speak. I'm not the only one talking today. <laughs> I was, yeah, I, really, we, had, we, we kicked around the idea of only me talking and you all have to talking just with the paddles, but no, it seems like a bad idea. Anyway, okay, underhyped. I would say underhyped. underhyped. I mean, I'm the I'm the low, I'm the lone overhyped, but uh, yeah. So let's get started. <laughs> we'll start hearing from our panel, and Andy, we'll start with you. Underhyped. Uh, why? Why underhyped? I think it's underhyped mostly because I don't think the average small business owner really knows that much about the new tax law, and especially if we think about the fact that it was passed basically a year ago. Mm. A lot has happened in a year, and people who run businesses they have a lot on their plate. They're not thinking about the tax law in all of 2018. So I think whatever hype and press it got uh, at the end of 2017, early 2018, has sort of fizzled out. And okay. people are now coming back to like, oh yeah, that's good. Yeah. Will, Kenji, go first. You go first. Okay. <laughs> I mean, I, I kind of feel like it's, it's a little bit of both. So I mean, I, I couldn't obviously show the, the middle side of this because would, you wouldn't be able to read it. But I, I feel like it's, <clears throat> it's underhyped in the sense of, Kind of its far reach in it and affecting everyone mm -hmm. entirely and i don't think everyone understands that it affects everyone um, so not a lot of people are aware that it affects everyone from from individuals all the way to corporations um, and then i think it's also a little overhyped in the sense that um, whether or not it's going to kind of like add fuel to a burning raging let's say deficit or something like that mm -hmm. uh, i mean obviously it was passed with intentions to uh, you know, cut taxes and create jobs, and that's still to be seen. But um, for the majority of things, I feel like it's underhyped um, 
when I take like Lyft drives and I go on the Ubers, I, I really make an intention to ask the drivers who are part of like a gig economy, right? Uh, what they feel a tax reform does to them, and they have like no idea. They said, they said this has nothing to do with me. Right. And um, and so that's kind of I feel like the general impression of the reform, and maybe because it was passed so quickly, and there really just wasn't a lot of promotion of it. That I think it was just one of those things that everyone knew passed, but has no idea that, that it affects them. Yeah. And you, what do you think? I guess first of all, have you seen your Lyft and Uber you know, rider rating plummet? Have you been testing all the yeah. drivers? And you, like, you've got to be a one star. Yeah, yeah that's, that's better really than every driver. driver. That's a little brutal, but um, <laughs> I'm surprised you can get a ride. Yeah, seriously. Yeah. Uh, I got the tax guy. Can we get a list of this? Uh, but um, no, I, I think I'm in agreement too on. I think it's mostly underhyped because um, it really does look like this is going to be very, very good for the, those small businesses, and there should be some. Um, extra tax savings for most people compared to the previous kind of tax uh, legislation. So that's probably been a bit underhyped. I think, like Will mentioned, on the overhyped side, um, I kind of feel like, and I think we may get into this a little bit, but like tax cuts are going to be there, but whether or not this actually creates a job stimulus and actually adds jobs, um, I'm not surprised that that's in there from maybe a political standpoint, but that whether that will really take hold or not, that may be a little bit of that. Well, it's kind of a question, too, isn't it? that the economy is doing pretty good right now, and there was a lot of, you know, not to get into too much of the economics of it, but some people feel like we already have a good economy, the tax cuts were supposed to kind of be an extra kind of boost, and some people don't really know if it really needs a boost right now. And so the timing is kind of a question too. Um, but I guess one thing I want to ask all of you is, why the lack of awareness? We mentioned that the bill was passed really quickly. You mentioned that small businesses really have a lot going on. Um, what do you all think as far as the lack of awareness or lack of understanding among small businesses? What is that mostly, what, what mostly led to that? I mean, personally, I think there's a couple of things. One, I think just in general, a lot of small business owners, money stuff is out of sight, out of mind until mm -hmm. you have to deal with it. Mm -hmm. And now we are finally coming into the point where we have to deal with it because now we're like in tax season, mm -hmm. but we weren't really dealing with it for most of last year. Um, and I think the other thing is to be honest, like I've read a lot of the articles about, you know, the new tax law and they are not accessible. Mm -hmm. The language isn't accessible, it's confusing. There was a lot of conflicting information out there. You know, someone was saying one thing, another person was saying another thing. There's a lot of speculation. And it's hard when you have, what, five minutes to read about this stuff and you can't even get through an article without having to like Google everything in it. Yeah. Yeah, I was going to say, I, I agree. And I think that also, I'm, I'm probably the oldest one, I'm guessing, sitting here. But the last time you mentioned, Caleb, it's been over 30 years since there's been a change in. You know, in what and how the tax legislation has worked, it's it's been a long time. I think people that's hard to kind of wrap your head around. I know that last time this changed, I was still living at home with my parents. Like I said, <laughs> you know, so I, I don't think many of us know any other way besides what we've been used to from a tax standpoint. So, like you mentioned, Amy, this is now we're in tax season, we're about to find out what this really means. So, I think in all of that, it's been a little bit hard for people to kind of conceptualize and wrap their head around what this is going to mean for them in the future. Yeah, and I would agree. I, I think for the majority of, of Americans, you know, money is out of sight, out of mind. And, um, and generally during tax season is when you do see the fruit of any kind of legislation come out in dollars, in real dollars. And so I think probably after this tax season, you'll probably see a little bit more of awareness out there because, you know, I think a lot of Americans will see the fruit of the tax reform. Um, you know, at my firm, almost everyone is going to benefit from the changes in the reform. So, and not to get into the, the economics part of it, but uh, do, do any of you follow NFID? NFID is the hmm. National Federation of Independent Business. And what they do is they're, they, they take a lot, of, a lot of economic data points from small businesses. And they produce a quarterly report, really amazing to, to read. And they produce what they call a, a specific number, and it's called the Small Business Optimism Index Rate. And it's a specific number that's supposed to mimic how optimistic small business owners are. And the, the rate hit its all-time high in like 35 years back in, I think, Q3 of last year. So like August, September of last year. 
at, at 108. And it's currently hovering at like 104, 105. The lowest it's ever been down in the low 80s was around 2009, I believe. And then when the reform passed, um, NFID showed a huge spike as far as small business optimism. And their index rates, it's, it consists of a lot of things. You know, compensation, salaries, inventory on hand, um, even job creation optimism, uh, whether or not they had plan on hiring more. And so, you know, we're not, I don't know if we're reading a lot of content out there at the moment that's indicating that small businesses are bringing on new jobs, but as far as the index rate or the optimism of what's going on with the economic landscape of this potential reform, it's very, very optimistic at the moment. And I think that as tax seasons kind of go past 2019, 2020, start to happen, I think, I think there'll be a little more awareness as far as just cash, because the more cash you get, I think you'll be more aware of the reform. Interesting. Um, so one thing that we haven't mentioned that I'll just ask as a kind of a bit of a follow-up is uh, everybody here is an accountant of some measure. Why haven't businesses been hearing from their accountants? Or maybe that's the question I'm asking. Um, have businesses, should be should businesses be hearing from their accountants about this? Would, there, would that have helped with the awareness? Does it seem like there's a, I don't want to say a failure, but I, maybe I am saying a failure on the part of the accounting community to, to educate their clients about it? Yeah, I, I think um, present company excluded. <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. We're totally on top of the ball. Um, I think, for the most part, uh, because I think there was a lot of conflicting information out there on the reform early on, I, I, I think professionals were probably still wading through a lot mm. of that data. And it depends on the practice as well. You know, if the practice is very proactive, as let's say if they provide tax services or even whatever kind of service, if they're more proactive about how the reform's going to impact you as far as bookkeeping is concerned with meals entertainment or, you know, specific deductions that are now fading away, um, if that's a value added that they're providing, I think a lot of firms would jump that direction because they're so valued. But for the most part, firms and taxpayers are just trying to figure out what is happening, here, what, what actually occurred, and how is this going to affect my clients. I will take the bait on that one. Okay. I, I'll say that. <laughs> and I do think there has been a challenge in this. I think we, we hear a lot about this. We decided at our firm, we actually go ahead and launch a tax practice this year. And really, a lot of that, we have not wanted to do that. We've been around for a long time and tried to avoid doing taxes. We just kept consistently hearing over and over again from clients of ours who you're doing bookkeeping or other services for, that they just did not have a relationship with their, with their CPA doing their taxes. There's no proactive nature to it. And they kind of just wait and hear it, you know, during tax season for, you know, about what they need. And there's just not, a, there's not any kind of communications can work. So, yeah, I think there was, I mean, there's a bit of a failure there. I think it's important that CPAs and tax professionals, even while we're still trying to figure this out, because like we've talked about, none of us exactly know how else to flush out. It doesn't mean we can't be having conversations with our clients, because there's certainly more, uh, the small business owner is more stressed out about this than we as tax practitioners are. Mm -hmm. So we should be having those conversations. I do think there's been yeah. way too slow for the profession to be doing this. Andy, what do you think? I agree completely with Kenji. Um, I feel like a lot of tax preparers and CPAs don't have a really personal relationship with their clients. And I have a lot of clients who work with different uh, tax preparers or CPAs in whatever capacity. So I see a lot of the relationships between a lot of different groups of people. And it is amazing to me how they are not proactive at all. And sometimes, even though it's not technically my role, I'll mention things to them to ask their tax preparer about. Yeah. And I'm like, I don't think I should be telling you to ask these questions. And really, truly, your tax preparer or CPA should be telling you these things or asking you these questions. Do you know about this? Do you know about that? Good. Um, my friendly uh, crew has just reminded me that we are posting survey questions during the broadcast. And our first question is up now. Yes, it is up now. Yeah, it is up now. And it is, do you, the question is, do you think the uh, TCJA, or the, that's the tax reform bill, the shorthand, uh, the intent uh, for the tax savings to create new jobs, do you think it'll work? Yes, no, or uh, maybe you don't know what we're talking about. You just joined <laughs> and you are really confused. But anyway. Uh, Please answer those questions as they kind of pop up through the broadcast. Uh, we really appreciate your engagement. Um, my next to uh, topic of discussion for the panel is uh, about 
the qualified business income deduction, and what this was, prop, uh, excuse me, popularly known as the 20% pass-through deduction. It was widely covered in the media. Uh, for those of you who aren't familiar, I'll try to give a little bit of background without boring you to death. But um, a lot of lawmakers, when they were early drafts of the bill, it was uh, it was felt that it was too friendly to big businesses because there was this big corporate tax rate cut, which was uh, I think definitely overhyped. Uh, but, um, <laughs> but anyway, so in response to that, they they developed this QBI uh, deduction or this 20% pass-through deduction, and that brought some of these other lawmakers who were pushing for small business incentives um, into the fold. So, and what it does is it allows pass-through business owners to deduct 20% of the income from their businesses. Uh, there's a caveat though, there's lots of caveats, but one key caveat is that it, it cannot be a specified service trade or business. Um, and then it, it, there's also some income thresholds and it gets complicated quickly. But uh, the main point is that this was supposed to be a really big boost for small businesses. That was the purpose behind including these provisions. So my question all to you is this QBI deduction, is it overhyped or underhyped? Mm, that is hard. Oh, so we I mean, agree. I think we are. We're yeah. unanimous agreement. Cool. All right. So let's talk about it. <laughs> I mean, it, it, so I covered I covered this issue quite a bit and read lots about it. It's extraordinarily complicated. I think a lot of the coverage had to do with the you know the risks and the possibility of gamemanship and stuff like that. But for you know you know a brick and mortar type business, manufacturing business, small business. Um, that is either you know in retail or something like that. There seems to be a really good opportunity here, um, or you know, to to be eligible for a deduction and save some, um, to have some tax savings and put that money back into your business somehow, either giving your employees raises or maybe offering health insurance. I don't know. I mean, what do you what do you all think? I uh, would love to hear your thoughts about it. And um, yeah, Kenji, we'll start with you this time. Yeah, I, I agree that it's, it's been underhyped. It seems like I think some of the discussion has been around all the different exceptions. And I think mm -hmm. that's been, especially around the types of services you can do. And it's probably not a place to deep dive here because there's a whole bunch of stuff out there about what types of business you have to do. And I think that got a lot of attention mm -hmm. um, and maybe distracted from the fact that by and large, really a, a large group of small businesses are going to be eligible for this deduction. Even though there's some income thresholds, but it's really trying to kind of get there'd be a little bit more parity between the more standard and typical small business entities and also along the parity with the big, you know, usually C-Corps, which are kind of the bigger company entities, essentially. So I think that's been under hype and maybe just missed out a little bit because everyone's trying to figure out, well, you know, what about all these exclusions and why are those in there? So that's, that's been my take on what it's been under hype. And it should be for, for most small business owners something they should be really looking forward to. It would be one of the primary drivers why under the new regs, they'd be seeing some some savings and some of their taxes. You know, I'll, I'll say that when you look at it in context, you know, small business in general is about half of the economy here in the U.S. Small businesses provide more than 80% of the jobs here in the United States. So when you look at it at the context of that, you know, and including some piece of legislation that has reform that benefits small business owners, and this really is, I think what's under hyped about it too is, a lot of people thought that the tax cuts really were for big business, and it really wasn't. It was really meant for small business pass-through entities. You know, if you have a partnership, you know, S corp, thing, a little Schedule C or something like that. Because if you make too much, it goes away. Mm -hmm. um, and so, and too much is defined as something like you know anywhere between two hundred and four hundred thousand dollars. That's too much. And so, uh, it's really meant to give a break to the small business sector that really do provide a majority of the economy, a majority of the jobs. And back to Kenji's original point, whether or not it will create more jobs by taking those savings and kind of passing them along um, is yet to be seen. NFIB really, uh, what's interesting is on NFIB's reports and that National Federation of Small Business, that index rate, well, the majority of the take up on the index rate is actually uh, reinvestment into inventory. And so uh, what you're seeing, I think, I feel like what you're seeing out there is you're seeing small business owners getting more cash and then what they're doing is they're reinvesting in trying to grow the business further. Um, so, you know, um, 
it's underhyped in that sense. Uh, once again, gig economy. Gig economy, I think, is really huge. It's becoming really huge. You know, Airbnb, Uber, Lyft, Fiverr. These uh, these gigs that you get yourself into, it really affects those kind of people. Selling things on Etsy, selling things on Amazon. I mean, that that is a big chunk of our economy, and uh, and I feel like it's really underhyped, especially around the gig economy as well. Mm -hmm. I think a lot of giggers out there, people who get themselves into gigs really don't understand that this reform really is meant for people like them. Right. Um, or at least it definitely includes them. They're part of the party. Um, you know, but they don't know they don't realize that they are. Um, just to give some context, I got a couple of stats. The Brookings Institu institution, excuse me, says that about 95% of businesses in the US are pass throughs. Tax Foundation puts it around 90. So anywhere 90, 95%, like you say, big chunk of the small businesses are these pass throughs that we're talking about. And also the gig economy, um, the most recent stat I was just reading this morning, I think it's about 12%, um, yeah, something, good. which is, and it was 10%, I think, um, I don't know, for I think 2014 was the last time they measured it. So you're right. Um, Andy, want to include you also, any thoughts about the pass-through deduction? Yeah, so I read this question about underhyped, overhyped in terms of how excited small business owners mm -hmm. are about it, in terms of like their personal feelings and like, when they file their taxes. And then, so the reason I chose under hype is because I have sort of tested the waters with some clients and self-employed friends to see how they feel. And they just feel like it's this really vague idea of like, oh yeah, there's this like 20% thing. And it kind of goes back to what we were talking about earlier is a lot of them are relying on their accountants to figure that out for them. So they're not really even anticipating a savings or excited about a savings or thinking about a savings because to them, it's all just something that's going to happen when they file the taxes and whatever's going to happen is going to happen. Yeah. Okay. So raises another question. Has the accounting community done enough to educate themselves about this particular provision? I get the sense that to hear you talk about it, probably not again, because you seem to be proactive, but it sounds as though maybe, I mean, there's 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 some people that really like the the, the tax experts out there that really follow this stuff closely. Um, they might be on top of it, but in general, is the accounting community have they have they gone as far as they need to, or what sense do you get from talking to your colleagues and, and partners? I'd say that's probably why you opened up a tax practice, right? <laughs> yeah. I, I think I think we see some. Um, some really lucrative opportunities down the pike as far as assisting small business owners and pass-throughs. Um, I do believe that uh, there isn't a lot of content out there that really breaks down this 20% deduction in a very chewable way, mm -hmm. you know, a digestible way for professionals. I, I think you're absolutely right, Caleb. I think there's a lot of provisions inside of it that make it really complicated. Um, but I think as accounts, we naturally make things, we overcomplicate things too. We try to fixate on the, on the potential or the what if, when really what we need to do is just kind of hone in on the generalities of things. Um, but for the most part, there, there aren't a lot of easy, attainable, digestible courses or CPE programs or things that you can get yourself into to, to continue your education in how this particular aspect plays out. Um, I think from our clientele base, what they're hearing from like our firm is that they have a chance to save money. I think that's the general gist. Okay, what you're saying is I'm going to pay, I'm going to claim less money as far as taxable income. For the most part, yes, it's an additional deduction kind of thing, and it's a it's a sweeping generality. Um, and so I think for a lot of people trying to get into the weeds, it's just way too hard. Yeah, I think that's it. That's a challenge that we've had as a profession is we love to get in and kind of really nitpick the technical aspects within uh, within the profession and kind of go deep there and kind of look at the code without thinking about really if the small business owner who is actually the client. So a lot of the stuff I've seen about it has been in either regurgitation of just the code like you mentioned, or I think Andy, you mentioned earlier about who's out there actually spending time talking to the small business owner in their language. The stuff I've seen out there typically has been around Lots of all the different firms and accounting you know, subject matter experts talking in really specific technical terms that are really only conversations that are happening within the accounting community that have been shifted over to happen within the small business community. Um, exciting updates to share with you all. <laughs> You've been answering our survey questions on your screen. Thank you for doing that. Um, and if you haven't seen the results, uh, 
for this question. How much did you hear about the QBI deduction? 11% uh, said a lot. 54% uh, 54, 54 of you have responded a little. And 35% have literally no idea what we're talking about. So <laughs> over a third of the respondents are completely in the dark. And so I don't know. We're not going to point fingers here. But <laughs> You're not alone. Well, yeah. Can I, can I ask yeah, please. Because yeah. I think this becomes a conversation, too, about is it about the accounting community educating ourselves about this law or is it about us educating ourselves about our clients and how to speak to them in a way that really makes sense to them and how to share this information in a way that's accessible? Yeah. Okay, so next topic, what would you, if you were going to give a theme to this tax season or busy season, I know you're not a tax repair, preparer, you're brand new to it, so <laughs> I don't know. So Will, this is your question. Yeah, <laughs> don't know if you know what you're doing, but in any oh, case, it, what, what's, what's the overarching theme here as we kind of, we're, you know, we're, we're going into this tax season, um, you know, our government isn't really operating at the moment, but we'll set that aside for now. But what, what, what's the overarching theme here? I mean, Andy, when we've had conversations off camera, I mean, you had a nice way of summing it up. So maybe we'll start with you. Yeah. So my theme is this is not the year to DIY your taxes. Mm -hmm. I think out of any year, this is really the year to seek out a professional. And I would even add to that now to really spend your time finding a professional if you don't already have someone that does your taxes for you to research people and interview people and find someone who you feel really comfortable with because we're talking about language and we're talking about information and we're talking about activity. And so if you're going to enter into a relationship with somebody who is filing your taxes and you're depending on them to help you save money, you wanna be sure that's the right person. So it also means not procrastinating. Mm -hmm. Start looking for your tax preparer now. Don't wait until April 1st. Okay, Kenji, Will? Yeah, I mean, I would say that, yeah, this is the year to not DIY your tax returns. And if you are DIYing it, then I think this is the year that you should add at least two more questions to your, to your question list. And uh, just simple things like, how does the tax reform affect me personally? I mean, that's a, that's a simple question that's very vague enough uh, if you're working with someone or if you're not working with someone to really ask the people that are preparing your tax returns to see if there's anything out there that really specifically impacts you. And if the answer is yes to that, then you probably should just drill down a little further and just say, what, what in particular of the tax reform affects me personally, me and my family? And I think that, I think in 2019, I think for, for a majority of us, it's going to be a learning curve of the reform. It's going to be what is in particular affected my tax refund or my tax bill and they may find out one or two or three things, tops. And I think in 2019, what you should do is write those down, set them aside, and do a little research, dig into it a little bit. You don't have to figure out the whole reform, and I think that's what happens, is you, you have this big piece of legislation that's huge, and you know, the past 35 years, we've never done anything like this. And you look at it and you think like, whoa, that's just way too much to digest. Well, don't do it like that then. Then just pick one or two things that may interest you and dig into it and see if there's anything in there that really impacts your family. Yeah, I think the, the theme is opportunity. It, one, if you're a small business, it, it, it's very likely you're gonna have a lighter tax bill. So it's, it should be exciting to think about where there are opportunities to either invest in your business. Um, so that should be exciting to you. I think this, the second one is really out to, again, the accounting community, especially tax preparers. There have not been any changes in decades. So you finally got a change. You got something to actually engage your small business clients with. This is a great time to be having a conversation with them. So I, even though there's a lot of questions, I would just say there's a great opportunity to lean into all the change, and at least it brings it top of mind in a way that you can kind of spend time communicating with your clients. So I think there's a lot, a lot of good things amidst a little bit of chaos, a little bit mm -hmm. of a challenge there. There's a lot of opportunity for folks. Okay, so we have to do our little vote. Um, so tax prep help, overhype or underhyped, I think. No, we're all on the same page. All right. <laughs> and um, also, our next survey question is on your Facebook live screens now. <laughs> and our crew is dancing or something. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> this is the survey question dance that's going on. If you have tax savings, if you're a small business and you have tax savings, what are your plans for them? Uh, will you give your employees raises? Will you invest back in the business, inventory, or maybe? Big ticket items, uh, shopping spree, maybe you'll hoard it. I don't know. Whatever you think you will end up doing with those savings, uh, let us know. All right. Um, 
Last question I have, uh, and I don't know, we'll see where this goes, but you know, we're, we're already in year two of this new law. It's, it's amazing how fast it's gone. Um, you know, we have the tax season to get through and we'll, we'll, we'll kind of take that experience with us, both businesses and accountants. Uh, I'm gonna ask you all to kind of do some, I don't know, crystal ball gazing, I guess. But uh, what do you think the future holds uh, in the in the wake of this new law? I mean, we're just kind of getting started, so I'm just curious to think, what should we be looking for for the rest of this year, but then in 2020 and beyond? Well, well the reform is only planned for 10 years, right? So we got we got 10 years to live. Especially the, the small business Especially the pieces, sm yeah, right. specifically, right. Yeah, specifically the small business pieces. Um, that's a really hard question. I, I think only reason why is I, th I think there are a lot of variables that impact that the answer to that. One is economically, you know, you, once again, you have a reform <clears throat> that I think is very, very good for business, very good for taxpayers and people who e don't even own businesses. So very good for just individuals and families, um, that give them potentially more money, which will, for the most part, you know, uh, typical for the American consumer spend, right? So we're, we go on a spending spree. So will that just add, you know, a raging fire to, to a deficit that our country has um, overall? Plus, I mean, a lot of people call the reform irresponsible as well. I will mm. give credit to that. You know, mm. a lot of people are concerned about the reform because it's not going to give the government as much money and there's a lot of spending going out there. So if you're not making much, but you're spending a lot, that's a problem. And so, right, the tax cuts were supposed to pay for themselves, and so far, right. there's really no evidence of that. Right, no evidence of that. Um, there's a lot of optimism that there, people are going to use all that money and do a lot of things with it. So, um, there's that one aspect of it. Uh, for the most part, I think probably in years three, four, maybe five, I think we'll start to see really its true impact. Obviously, the markets are raging, right? Mm -hmm. so the stock market's raging, hitting all time highs. You know, the small business optimism index rate is at an all time high. So there's a lot of indicators at the moment that like economically we're doing really well. People are really stoked about what's going on. Um, whether it's going to stay there and last, you know, is, is really, I have no idea. Yeah, lots of variables. Lots of variables. Mm -hmm. there. Mm -hmm. um, just early returns from our survey question. 5% uh, say they will give their employee raises. 68% uh, plan to invest it back in their business. 5% are going to go American and go shopping. <laughs> and, then, max. and then the 21% say they're going to hoard it. So, um, it, are, it, you know, what's interesting is yeah. NFIB really is touching on that point too. NFIB really, their report indicated that a lot of people who, a lot of small businesses are going to reinvest. And that's, that's really interesting that even in the survey, that's also being stated, but, um, yeah, in NFIB's fourth quarter report, that was like the overarching thing. Yeah. It was reinvestment, reinvestment, reinvestment. So. Yeah. Andy, what, what about you? Uh, will you be starting a tax practice over the last <laughs> couple of years? Or what? I will okay. not be. Um, but I think for me, when I, like with this question, it's sort of more of a hope than what I think, like crystal ball gazing, which is I hope that because this is a big change, this is an opportunity for people to become more proactive about their finances, to become more engaged with the money in their business, to learn more about their taxes and to be um, empowered about learning more about their taxes. I hope that that is a catalyst and that we start to build those engaged relationships with our finances. Kenji, are you uh, prognosticating? Sure. <laughs> something wild, something Why not? Why not? Why not? Yeah. Um, no, I, I think in the short term, I would still expect to see, because this will be the first time we're going to get some filings actually out there and going to get some responses back from Uncle Sam about so it looks like so I think this year I can still see people being fairly conservative trying to kind of figure out and kind of deal with what the new reform looks like I think over the long haul though I'm again I'm still pretty optimistic I just I tend to have maybe it's being an entrepreneur small business owner I do have a lot of faith in entrepreneurs and small business owners so I like reform that puts more income back into small businesses and entrepreneurs I just think that we're we even get more broadly as, as a country that's kind of our dna is being very entrepreneurial so I, I like seeing legislation and help go back to small business owners i don't know what that's going to mean but if that continues I, I just i feel like that'll be good for the overall small business community great uh 
Another survey question um, should be up on your screens now. And the question is, do you believe tax reform has had a positive effect on your business? Uh, and your answer options are yes, no, we're not sure. So please choose one of those and we'll report back with some uh, stats in a second. I wanna, I wanna go back to this uh, point that you made about Starting businesses, I think you're right. It, is, it, is, it isn't uniquely American entrepreneurship, but there is a certain, American entrepreneurship does have a certain mystique maybe, or you know, the, the possibility. Um, and I'm just curious what you all think in general about this bill as it relates to entrepreneurism. entrepreneurism. Will, do you, do you all agree if, with Kenji that it will kind of bring more people that are kind of thinking about starting a business? Do you see more people kind of going that route? Or with, you know, kind of the volatility in, in, in the markets and maybe some uncertainty in the economy, uh, especially over the next couple of years, will, will we see people kind of um, resist? I mean, I, I, I personally believe that um, anybody who's kind of like been on the fence about starting a business will, will be more than likely to reconsider staying on the fence that is i think they'll get off the fence and they'll actually start something um for for one of two reasons i think one is if the reform doesn't last longer than 10 years and it gets let's say replaced or taken away especially let's say the, the small business benefits then all they all they've done is they've missed out on the opportunity so that's one and then, then i think secondly i think what you're going to see is a lot of potentially a lot of wowing from small business owners saying, whoa, this reform really did help me. I really did save. I really did reinvest. I really did do this and I really did do that. And other people are going to say, huh, they're going to get the FOMO fear, right? You know, the fear of missing out and they're going to go at it. They're going to start a business. They're going to try an entrepreneurial endeavor and try to figure things out. So I think, I think people will, will get off the fence for one of two reasons. One is the FOMO that they would get from seeing other people being trying and, and let's say maybe slightly being successful. And then secondly, I think you'll see uh, professionals getting better and better at communicating that um, there are a lot of benefits in the reform. And if they do well, that it's not, it may not last forever. So I, I think that'll encourage people to kind of get off the fence a little bit and get in the game. What do you think? So I personally don't think people start businesses based on tax reform. But what I do think is that the tax reform will make having a small business easier, which will then make it more sustainable for people to have businesses. Because a lot of people start businesses and it's hard. It's not an easy thing to do to be an entrepreneur. And so the more uh, financial incentive there is, the more tax incentive there is, I think it'll allow these businesses to get through those first, you know, two to three really tough years and then like get up to a point of sustainability. Yeah, I, I totally agree with you. I think that things like the, a better catalyst probably for entrepreneurship or things like the gig economy and side hustles as people have, that's probably a bigger way for people to kind of dip their toe into being a business owner. Yet, I think it'll be helpful to your point about if, if there's also financial incentives around taxes, that's great. I still think there are other motivators to help too. So right. you're gonna see those kind of work in conjunction. Yeah, yeah. Okay, uh, some results from our most recent survey question, uh, do you believe tax reform has had a positive effect on your business? And 18% have said yes, 12% no, and 71% are not sure. So yeah, it's early in the game. And so that's that that seems about right. Um, and, and I think like the tax reform isn't like a picture that you post on your Facebook that gets thumbs up, thumbs downs right away. Well, that's you right. know, like it, it's it's not one of these things that you immediately see like the reform working through your business, like you know something going in through your bloodstream. Um, and and so that that absolutely makes sense to me. And um, I think that's where I think it'll take several years before people can probably look back right. and be able to answer that that question with a little more confidence of like. Well, maybe not. No, I didn't see really any big impact. Or, you know, yes, I did see something, you know, one year I saved a little bit of money in taxes and, you know, that's the only thing that really stuck in my mind. Kind of thing. I want to come back around to um, the accounting community. And I know we have some accounting viewers or accountant viewers out there. What should, as you're all firm owners or firm partners, what should a 
accountants be thinking about in the years ahead? I mean, I think we focus pretty, uh, uh, pretty closely on small businesses. Do you all have any opinions about accounting firms and what opportunities lie ahead for them? Getting into the tax practice business yeah. like you did. <laughs> 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 no, 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 it's too crowded. No, I, I think I think accounts are going to learn. Um, obviously, they're they're going to dust off the monocles, right? They're going to get into the research business and figure out how this reform really affects them. I, I think we've been kind of like peddling the same knowledge skill set for the past thirty years, and now this reform is going to get us out there and kind of like you know, we're going to flex our muscles a little bit more, our brain muscles. And um, I think what you'll see from the accounting side is you'll see firms re question whether or not they want to get into this tax game, just like you did. Mm -hmm. um, and, I, you know, and I'm kind of curious to hear whether or not the reform actually encouraged that on your side, besides the, the individuals that encourage you to get into uh, the tax practice. But I, I think you'll see firms reconsidering whether or not they want to enter in the um, tax preparation business or the consulting tax preparation business or tax strategy advising. Uh, because there's a lot of opportunities to do something new, and I, I think it's like a new frontier of tax law that hasn't been really vetted out like, it, like the old code has been for 30 years. So kind of like the old code, everybody's kind of learned already the ropes, all the ins and outs, all the loopholes. But with the new reform, not everyone knows all the loopholes yet. Not, a, not everyone knows how to implement the loopholes if there are any. Or let's say uh, really provide some advice that saves somebody a, a little bit more money if they split their business apart from service to non-service or something like that. So I, I think you'll see a lot of professionals kind of rethink that a little bit. Yeah, I don't, I don't think you have to be um, a master of deconstructing the tax code to really go out and help small businesses in this case. Right. Um, you know, for us, a lot of this started through just connecting with other peer firms and just talking about what they're doing to think about how to address this for small business clients. And I've always found that that's one thing I really love about the accounting community is we are very helpful to one another. We talk to each other about what things and practices we're doing. I think that that's something that more tax professionals need to take advantage of, talk to other firms about it, um, run some scenario analysis. I know that's as, a, as an accounting kind of geek. To me, being able to see what the old reform look like, the old tax practices look like compared to the new reform are very helpful. So just do some of those, talk to peers, run some scenario analysis. There's a lot of tools out there that you do it. All the new tax software is updated for all the new codes. You can put some scenarios in there and take a look at what it means for your clients and at least get that kind of, that process going within your own firm and own practice. And I think, again, if you run into questions, you can, there's probably a ton of other professionals out there who are going through some of the same challenges. You can absolutely bounce ideas on. Andy, what would you say to a, like a firm owner like yourself, somebody who doesn't specialize in taxes, but clearly has you know, uh, a core set of clients that you obviously do a good job communicating with, what would you recommend to those firm owners who are kind of in a similar situation? Um, well, in terms of opportunities, I think that there's a huge opportunity for financial education products. I think that that's a really big area, especially with digital products and having so many platforms for digital products right now. I think that's a huge area that you can explore. Um, but I think also, you know, what retains clients and what gets you new clients is being, having those personal relationships with your current clients and even doing more education work with your current clients. We talk a lot about being proactive with your current clients, reaching out to them. I think you mentioned at one point in another conversation we had that you ran scenarios for your clients. Yeah, yeah. And like all of those little things will help you grow your practice. Um. Any final thoughts? We're kind of wrapping up as far as our questions are concerned. We have a few questions. Right? We do have a few questions in our comments, so I think we're going to address those live on the air. So that's exciting. <laughs> <laughs> so oh, we're hyped. No, yeah, yeah. Under hyped. Under hyped. Right? Yeah, <laughs> so um, yeah, uh, Mohini. Yeah. Shout them out. So. Sure. Here's one question from our viewer Callie. Um, she's wondering if there's any clarification yet on whether passive rental income qualifies for the deduction? I don't know if any of y'all would have an answer to that. I mean, I, I would say the, the reform, the, so that 20% deduction uh, does apply to real estate, mm -hmm. um, real estate property. Um, I, I don't recall whether or not the passive or non-passive is an issue in that particular aspect of the reform. Um, Consult your tax advisor. That's right, <laughs> <laughs> tax advisor. Uh, but I, I think for just 
from general memory, uh, a pass-through is considered anything where the company itself doesn't pay federal taxes but passes through down to you. And so, you know, real estate rental properties, Schedule C's, you know, Schedule F, which is a rental, the property worksheets, things like that, um, will all qualify for that. I think in the code, in the tax reform, really where the stickler was, was whether or not the business that you have is service-based versus non-service-based. Mm. So, you know, the, the benefit of the reform phases out a lot earlier. It basically goes away a lot quicker, you know, as a service-based business. So I do accounting, that's a service-based business. Um, if you have a non-service-based business, like selling widgets on Amazon or, or you know, selling whatever, um, the code is more favorable for someone like you than it is for someone like me. So I, I um, you know, I don't believe there's anything that, in my mind, that really kind of falls on the passive versus non-passive on the rental property. Nope. Okay. Gotcha. <laughs> Next question. Next, Next question. <laughs> One other question I think is just for all of y'all in your practices. How are you planning for a manageable busy season? Mm. Let's go into that. Andy, you want to go first? Yeah, knowing that it's a busy season is the first step. <laughs> yeah. is in, but really, like, really understanding that it's your busiest time of year in the next three three months. And um, scaling back in other areas of my business where usually I scale up more. Um, and also, I did something this year where in December, I began to collect as much as possible from all of my clients because and gave them really strict deadlines. Um, because knowing that this tax season would just be a little bit busier with the tax reform and everything. Um, so I think getting as much as you can as early as you can, because if you have clients, you know they're laggers and <laughs> that it takes a long time to collect things from people and that can add on to the stress of having, you know, multiple projects and clients that you're working with at once. Yeah, we um, actually through talking to a lot of other peer firms out there, we Built, you know, built up our tax practice. One thing that we were very specific in doing is that we are not going to take on tax clients who we don't also have an ongoing relationship doing some other accounting services with. Um, we just didn't feel like, and that's a relationship, one time a year coming in and dropping off tax returns. For us as a firm, that makes it incredibly difficult to staff. And we don't get a chance to work with you and kind of help advise you throughout the year. So a lot of that came from good advice from other firms who've kind of been there and done that before. That's one way to really throw a kink in your busy season. And I know that as firms, we're always trying to grow, so it may seem like it's a good idea to take anybody who comes and knocks on your door and says, I'll pay you whatever to do your tax return. I would just caution you to think about, is that going to work from a staff perspective? Are you going to crush your staff with that, with a bunch of clients who are honestly just trying to be one-time clients who are going to come and not have an ongoing relationship with you. So we're hoping that that strategy of being on a more recurring basis with them helps Kind of mitigate a bit of that huge spike that typically tax practices go through this time of year. Yeah, I would say I think you're 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 going to get hit in two different angles. One is a a an announcement of the reform angle. That is, if you've not communicated the reform to your clients by now, I think what you're going to get is a slew of clients going. So what's up with the reform, and how's this impacting me? And I think you're going to get yourself into deeper, longer conversations during the busiest time of the year. So that's one way. Uh, and then the second thing is maybe all the DIYers getting off and actually having tax preparers coming to them, going to tax preparers to have them do tax returns. Uh, like, you know, for me, announcing the reform early on was really big for us um, because, well, A, I was very excited about it because I just wanted to see monetarily like what it was going to do to my clients. And so I remember when, when the reform passed in December of 17, uh, Wall Street Journal rolled out a really cool calculator that let you drop in some figures and, and I think in our, in our very, in the 2018 tax season, we were taking people's tax returns and dropping them in this Wall Street Journal calculator thing. And, uh, and even then, when we were talking about their 2017 return, we were already having conversations about 2018 and the tax reform. So, but, you know, it, that doesn't solve, let's say, the DIYers coming up. So I think if you're kind of thinking ahead and 20, you're thinking about, let's say, 2020 tax season, I think you should for a lot of tax practitioners should be really proactive in 2019 in making the announcements to their to their clients during let's say tax conversations or 2018 tax conversations try to get ahead of the communication i think and i think it'll it'll fare well for you 
Okay. Yeah, we have a quick follow-up from Alex who asked the previous question. Are you using cloud-based tax software or desktop tax software? We, we were really, again, starting brand new from scratch. That's For us, we were like cloud only. You know, we, we felt like it's certainly time where we need to cut the cord on desktop software. It's kind of a little bit, I think, embarrassing as an industry, as a profession, that we still have a lot of desktop software out there. I'll say that we were very fortunate to be able to build it kind of in the modern era where we're like, guess what? If it's got to you know, live on a desktop or a server somewhere, we're not going to use it. So yeah, we, we have the luxury at least of not bringing on legacy clients and starting to use it with all cloud. Cloud or desktop? Yeah, I mean, cloud, if you can help it. Um, but, you know, tax preparation is one of those antiquated industries. I mean, it's just there's not, for whatever reason, and I, well, not for whatever reason. We know, we understand what it is. It's just our industry likes local desktop software. So, and so, therefore, the, the manufacturers and the vendors just don't innovate, right? They don't get ahead of that. They don't try to help lead the industry. They're not, they're not being asked. I mean, they're not innovating because we as a profession have not been asking them. Correct. So that's, yeah. yeah. It's not just on them. And they've not that. taken it upon themselves to say, you know what, maybe we should we help. Should yeah. yeah, we should help the people who use our software get into the cloud. So, you know, I think it's kind of like what comes first, chicken or the egg kind of thing. Um, but, yeah, if you can do cloud, I mean, we do cloud. Uh, oh, well, we don't have a true cloud one. It's a remote desktop. We use Pro Series, and um, which is an Intuit product, yes. And, uh, but, you know, and, and we all remote into it. So, you know, we, uh, if you can do cloud, I would definitely do cloud, yeah, if you can help it. Uh, Andy, would you... I would say cloud yeah. as well. I mean, I think this is a point where, like you said, we're at the point now that we really shouldn't even be having a conversation. Yeah. We should just, yeah, yeah. 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 You're mean, never late to the party. Let's just say that. If you're just coming to cloud, it's okay. No one will make fun of you. Just, you know, show up. Everyone's happy that you're here. <laughs> So we have one last question yep. um, from Trinity. It's a bit of a doozy. <laughs> Does the 20% pass through raise the threshold where becoming an escort is advantageous over being a sole proprietor? I can answer that. Yeah. So, uh, so, so just one more time, so I make sure I understand yeah. the question. Go ahead. Does the 20% pass through raise the threshold where becoming an escort is advantageous over being a sole proprietor? No, it does not. No, it does not, because uh, a pass-through is is not just one kind of entity. A pass-through is anything where the income or the loss is passed through. And there are various entity types. They call them tax classifications. And so, like, S-Corp is one of them. Partnership is one of them. Schedule C is one of them. Real estate property is one of them. So if you're a sole proprietor and you want to move to S-Corp, the threshold doesn't go up just because you go from one tax class to another tax class. Um, what changes the threshold is the kind of business you run, service versus non-service. So that changes the threshold. Also what changes the threshold is your filing status, single versus married filing jointly. So those kind of things change the thresholds, but not moving from one particular pass through to another. Not tax advice, by the way. <laughs> Consult your tax advisor. I think that this question is a great example of how like tax situations are so unique, and this is why we are recommending a 12 stream this year to yeah. go see a tax preparer because everyone's tax situation is so different mm -hmm. based on a lot of different factors that we can't all talk about right now and go through. Yeah, and your entity, I mean, whatever entity you are, just be mindful that's not just a tax decision. So don't let the kind of the old tax tail wag the dog there. There's a lot of legal reasons for having the right entity too. So don't yeah. forget to think about that side of it as well. That um, what's the impact of just the entity going to be on my tax return? But think about too making sure you've got that proper protection from a corporate entity as well. So there's some legal ramifications to take into account before making a switch. And entity changes are very, very difficult to go back on. Once you make them, they're very difficult to change. So it's not something you should do. Yeah. Too willy nilly on so just yeah, take caution. That's a good point because there's a lot of coverage in the media um, around the time was there was the question because the C Corp rate was going down twenty one percent, but a lot of people got like, you know, their eyes got bigger than their stomachs and they just thought, Oh, twenty one percent tax rate, maybe we should become a C Corp. When you're right, it's like by the time you go through it all, is it really worth it? Like some of the analysis that I read about some businesses were going to save maybe a thousand dollars by changing. It wasn't. It wasn't yeah. going to turn out to be worth it. So yeah. that's a really good point. I will say though, just to kind of like throw the cherry on top of that conversation, um, I, I do believe 
that if, if you if the majority of your income personally comes from your business and you are a sole proprietor, you should talk to a tax professional and consider other pass through options like S Corps because you can save money. Mm -hmm. So while the threshold and the reform doesn't affect you personally in that regard, going from sole prop to S Corp, there are other factors at play that will save you money because um, changing the way you have yourself taxed, you know, the more you have to manage the more administrative effort that caught that is caused in that change, uh, the more chance you have of saving money. Because that's how I kind of equate the two is, you know, it, when it's easy to run a business, that means you're generally paying the most in taxes. When it's a little harder, a little more administrative work to run a business, then generally you're getting yourself into this area where you have an opportunity to save more money. Side note, Andy wrote a really great article on uh, Gusto's Framework blog about this very issue. So I think it's being dropped in the comments right now. So if all this sounds good, check that out. Um, and yeah, we've got a couple minutes left. Any closing thoughts from anyone or everyone? <laughs> I mean, it's been a really great discussion. I really appreciate everybody's time. And it's, you know, I remember, you know, when I started going concern almost 10 years ago, tax reform was this thing that people just kind of bandied about and they were always talking about, it's like, wow, we really need tax reform, we really need tax reform. People talked about it for years and years and years. I really didn't think I would ever see it. And then it got thrown together in two months. And now it's really interesting to see the opportunities that have come out of, come out of it, but also you know, some controversy. There really is, it, it really has been an interesting thing to watch develop and now we're putting it in accountants and small businesses will start putting it into practice. And so it is a really interesting time. And like we've all been saying, lots of opportunity to, you know, for you all run really great accounting firms to help small businesses, but then there's also some, uh, opportunities for entrepreneurship too. Yeah, I mean, I, my closing thought is, um, I would say it's going to, it's going to, I think for a lot of taxpayers, it's going to take some effort to get knowledgeable on the subject, considering that it's not a subject that's being talked about because of all the other stuff that goes on in the media. So it's like going to a party and all you're seeing is cake and, 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 and cookies. And you're like, I really want to go for the vegetable tr the platter. You know, like it's really hard to actually pick up that carrot from the veggie tray when you have all this other stuff distracting you. So my, my closing thought is, you know, if, if in your mind you have some inkling of wanting to learn a little bit more, I, I think it's going gonna, it's gonna to cause a little more work to, for you to go find it because it's not something that's really being talked about. And with everything else, just overwhelming the conversation, it's, uh, it's something you're going to have to go out of your way, find some resources. Gusto's website has some great resources. Uh, like I run a YouTube channel and I try to do like videos on this topic. So it's really hard to pierce through the noise that's going out there trying to find the golden nuggets to try to to try to educate yourself so you're gonna have to like muscle it through i think a little bit in 2019 2020. yeah and i think that you know we still don't really know everything about this new tax law we're still learning because we are now finally filing our taxes for the first time under that tax law so it may not you may not have immediate answers it may not be that you know, the next two months, you're going to know everything you need to know and how it impacts your business. We might have to still wait and see as things evolve. Yeah, it's just not, it's not every day that um, our profession is in the national news as prolific as it has been. Um, in fact, it's, it's been over 30 years probably since there's been this much discussion about it. So again, lots of opportunity to get conversations going within the community and with clients in particular. So just use that. It doesn't mean you have to have all the answers. I mean, some of those to your point, it's our first time doing it, like Andy mentioned. This is going to be an evolving process over the next 10 years. But what you, what you don't want to do right now is sit back and you hunker down and not communicate with clients. That's going to be that's going to be a real problem going forward. So, I mean, I'd, I'd use it as a great way to connect, reconnect with some clients who maybe you haven't spoken with for a long time. Great. Well, we have to end it there. That's a wrap for this Gusto Facebook Live event on tax reform. I want to thank our panel, Andy Smiles, Kenji Kuramoto, and Will Lopez. Uh, please check out their websites, uh, andysmiles.com, acuity.co, and advisorfi.com. Check out Will's YouTube channel. I know it's been dropped in the comments. And if you're a business owner and you haven't worked with an accountant before, please check out Gusto's uh, partner directory and find yourself an accountant in your area. And likewise, if you're an accounting firm, and you're looking for some new small business clients, 
go to our partner directory and get yourself on there. Um, so thanks again, everyone, for joining us, and we'll see you next time.